Welcome to the next chapter on benzene and aromatic compounds. This is not uh, chapter 17 in the newest edition of the book. It's chapter 15, but the information is the same. So we'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail later. But uh, benzene, as you know, let's just draw the structure of benzene. So it says here benzene is a remarkably stable and unreactive compound. In, I believe this was chapter 11, we talked about electrophilic addition reactions, and alkenes will react with, ben, uh, with bromine, uh, go through a bromonium ion intermediate, and give you the 1,2 dibromo addition product. So remember 1,2 addition. If this was cyclic, it would also be anti addition. Well, benzene, the chemical formula here is C6H6, right? So in each corner here, we have hydrogen. If benzene were like a normal alkene, then one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. It has four degrees, but instead it reacts via substitution. So benzene, put the circle in the middle to indicate the double bonds. All right? We substitute a bromine in for this hydrogen. What they don't show you is the inorganic byproduct of hydrobromic acid. We'll talk more about that later, but in order to get this reaction to work, it also requires a Lewis acid catalyst, this iron 3 bromide. So anyway, uh, benzene and other aromatic compounds are not classified as alkenes, primarily because they do not behave like alkenes. We've already talked enough about benzene, how it displays resonance, um, all the carbons here are sp2 hybridized. All the bonds are the same length, and the atom is uh, uh, the molecule is flat. It's uh, planar. The structure shown here, where the double bonds are shown, kind of a static fashion, is uh, referred to as a Kekulé structure. Personally, I prefer the resonance hybrid structure, where we use the circle in the middle to indicate these delocalized pi electrons. electrons. A couple things about the couple other things about so we we talked about benzene is it's planar all the atoms are flat there are there is uh, all the hydrogens here are coming off in the same plane so unlike a cyclohexane where we had right we had axial and equatorial bonds you don't have that with hexane I'm sorry you don't have that with benzene. All the atoms are in the same plane. The other thing to note here is for a single bond, a carbon-carbon single bond, the bond length is 153 picometers. For a double bond, 134 picometers. Maybe one other thing I should mention. The shorter the bond, equals stronger bond. So the bonds in benzene, I'm sure, I'm sorry, the bonds in an alkene are stronger. There's more energy there. Again, that does not translate to reactivity. The double bond is more reactive than a single bond. But uh, because they're shorter, they're stronger. Well, the bonds in benzene are actually somewhat in between the single bond and double bond length. So at 139 picometers, they're intermediate in length, uh, and all the bonds are the same. So it doesn't mention that here. All bonds are the same length, this intermediate length. So what that means is there are no true, what I'll refer to as true double bonds or single bonds. in benzene. Instead, we have this hybrid that's somewhere in between a double bond and a single bond. A little bit of history here. Michael Faraday, one of the greatest experimental chemists ever, actually he lacked a, a quite a bit of formal training, so he didn't, uh, he kind of suffered from uh, not having particularly good math skills. But anyway, he's credited with 
first isolating benzene in 1825. 40 years later, Auguste Kekulé uh, reportedly, while uh, falling asleep, he had this had this dream, and uh, here they show a snake eating its tail, and he from this dream he was inspired to come up with the name or to come up with the structure for benzene. It wasn't until 1931 when another famous chemist, Linus Pauling, one of my favorite chemists, who's also, by the way, responsible for hybrid orbital theory, right here, hybrid orbitals for Linus Pauling, in 1931 came up with a modern quantum mechanical model for benzene. Benzene and its derivatives, some of them, this is many, but some of them have a strong characteristic odor. A lot of them were originally isolated from plants and they had these odors and so they referred to as aromatic. This is actually a misnomer now. So it is a misname. Not all aromatic compounds have a pronounced odor. Many of them do not. But uh, the name stuck. So aromatic now means actually something completely different, which we'll talk about later. So here we see a painting of Michael Faraday in his lab around 1850. A couple things you'll notice here. First off, he is not wearing any lab goggles, so that's a no-no. Another thing you'll notice here, there's a hammer. All right, Not many labs have hammers, but this hammer was used to uh, bludgeon students who didn't do their homework. All right. And also, kind of subtle here, there's actually a trap door here in the floor, and this is where he would put especially unruly students who either fell asleep in lecture, or didn't do their homework, showed up late for lab, and so forth. All right, so let's talk a little bit about naming benzene and its derivatives. So basically what we'll do is we'll just look at what's decorating the benzene ring, and then say benzene. So we have an ethyl group, fine, ethyl benzene. We have a T-butyl group, fine, we could say T-butyl or tert-butyl. The halogens, fluorochlorobromo, fine, chlorobenzene. There are some compounds that have uh, both a systematic IUPAC name, let me hear right, IUPAC, and then also a common name, and I'm going to ask you to know both. So a methylbenzene is known as toluene. Now you can go to the hardware store and buy this in the paint aisle and it's called Tolul. So Tolul is the same thing as toluene. Another one you should know is phenol. Phenol ends in O-L. It is an alcohol. All right. So you could call this phenol, common name, common name phenol, uh, the OH group, the alcohol group, is a hydroxy or hydroxyl group, so hydroxybenzene. This is also known as carbolic acid, and the reason for that is the pKa for this hydrogen, I think we talked about this in the chapter on acids way back when, the pKa for this is about 10, whereas for normal alcohols it's about 16, so this is about a million fold more acidic than normal hydrox or alcoholic hydrogens. So it's carbolic acid, also known as Lister's reagent. It was one of the first topical antiseptics that was used, and Dr. Lister was a contemporary of Pasteur and was instrumental in getting physicians and surgeons to sterilize their instruments in the operating field in their hands before they did their work so, they wouldn't, so their patients wouldn't die from postoperative infections. A PowerPoint document. I believe this is a hyperlink that talk that will take you to a web page that talks more about Lister's reagent. By the way, Listerine is not was not invented by Dr. Lister, but I think it's just named in his honor. The next one, aniline. Right? Common name aniline. Uh, this is an amine. Amines end in I N E, right? Amine ends in I N E. So uh, the uh, the NH2, this is an amino group, so aminobenzene. Most people refer to this as aniline or aniline. I do not want you to confuse this, so do not, do not confuse with anuline. There's, some, there's aniline or aniline and anuline. 
uh, benzene, no one ever refers to it this way, but benzene could also be called 6-anulene. And we'll talk more about anulenes later. But aniline, different from anuline. Then we have uh, benzoic acid. Right, so we just stick a acid functional group on here. Uh, benzyl alcohol. Now this is important. Notice the difference between benzyl alcohol, right, benzyl alcohol, and phenol. Here the oxygen is directly attached to the ring. With benzyl alcohol, we have a CH2 and then an OH. So this here, this pKa for this one is about 16 because it is not conjugated to the ring system. We had talked about how stabilization of the conjugate base through resonance makes the product, in this case the conjugate base, more stable. Well, this benzyl alcohol here is not resonance stabilized, whereas that of phenol is. Next one, uh, naphthalene. We have two rings stuck together. Naphthalene, well actually I should back up. Um, all of the toluene, phenol, aniline, and naphthalene all have very characteristic and pretty strong odors. Benzoic acid doesn't. It's a solid. You use this in the laboratory and it doesn't really have an odor at all. Phenol actually smells a bit like uh, chloroseptic throat spray, right? Because phenol is an antiseptic and a derivative of phenol is found in chloroseptic throat spray. Aniline, like a lot of amines, has a very ammonia kind of pungent uh, stench. It's a nasty odor. Naphthalene also has a pronounced odor and uh, naphthalene is used to chase away moths and rodents and other things. So it's uh, naphthalene is mothballs or moth flakes. Again, you can go to the hardware store or wherever and buy naphthalene. One other compound that I want to mention here is xylene. So remember, toluene has a one methyl group on it. If we had two methyl groups, it would be a xylene. Okay. So xylene is one you should know. And these two methyl groups could be on adjacent carbons, or they could be um, one, two, one, three positions, or one, four positions. We'll talk more about that later. And a last one here: if we had a mixture of a phenol and a toluene, so here we have phenol, here we have the methyl group. This is not a phenol; it's not a methyl group. This is called a cresol. And again, these two can be right next to each other. They can be uh, one and three or one and four. We'll talk more about naming disubstituted compounds or disubstituted benzene derivatives next. All right, so as I mentioned, disubstituted. This means we have two substituents on the ring. So two bromos right next to each other. We could call this, uh, well, first off, it's going to be di, I'm sorry, where is it named? Uh, it's going to be dibromobenzene. And they're right next to each other, so they're in carbons. One and two. One, one and two. It doesn't matter which way you, if there's only two things on the ring, it doesn't really matter in this case which way we name them clockwise or counterclockwise. In fact, I could number this the other way around. One, carbon two, carbon three. This is one, three. And then when they're, when they're across the ring from each other, one and four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. So this is IUPAC. 1, 2 dibromobenzene, 1, 3 dibromobenzene, 1, 4. These are all derivatives, or sorry, these are all isomers of each other. But chemists often use these Greek prefixes. These are, these are Greek prefixes. So ortho, you notice this ortho is in italics because it's a foreign language. So ortho is uh, Greek, which means right. Uh, or actually are correct, but I want you to think of it as right, meaning they are right next to each other. So ortho dibromobenzene is the same as 1, 2. Or you could just use the abbreviation O for ortho. Para uh, is uh, Greek for beyond. And these are essentially as far apart from one another as you can get. So if we, we went from 
1, 2, to 1, 2, 3, to 1, 2, 3, 4. If we moved it, the bromine here now, it would be 1, 3 again. So they're beyond or as far apart as possible. It says here, so think opposite or cross. I don't like to think of it. I'm crossing it off. I don't like to think of it as opposite. Think of them as across the ring from one another. So and the reason for this is because, remember, the ring is flat. There is no cis-trans. So, for example, if we had a cyclohexane and we were looking at it edge on, right? we could have two methyl groups, so this would be a xylene, right? Not a xylene. Well, it's cyclohexane, so it would be 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. And these are, yeah, they're, sorry, 1, 4. They're across the ring from each other. And they're on opposite sides, right? So these guys are trans. So for trans, I like to think of them as opposite. But when they're across the ring from one another, right, in this 1, 4 position, right? So here... They're across the ring from each other, one and four. Likewise, these guys are across the ring from each other. You do not have cis and trans with benzene. And if we draw the structure of benzene, again, edge on, right? All these atoms, I'll put the, some hydrogens in too, all these atoms are in the same plane. So there is no cis or trans but they can be across the ring from each other. So don't think of them as opposite, which might confuse you with cis and trans. Think of them as across the ring. So find ortho right next to each other, para, beyond, as far apart as possible. Meta, think middle, the middle position, one and three. Okay, some other rules for naming, just as always, alphabetize them. We are going to, well, I'm going to name this a couple of different ways. First off, B comes before C, right? So it's going to be bromo, Chloro benzene. Now, if you use the ortho meta para system, you don't have to worry about numbering the ring. Uh, you just say ortho and find the two are right next to you. You wouldn't say ortho one, two. It's, you use either one or the other, right? You would use either the ortho meta para system or the numbering. I'm going to number this a couple different ways now. here. Okay. If I were to number this, I could number it 1, 1, 2. I should use a different color here. Or I could number it 1, 2. One way is correct. One is incorrect. I drew it correctly first. So this is going to be 1 bromo, 2 chloro, benzene, benzene, one bromo, two chloro, and that's because, right, we alphatize B comes before C. Well, here I have it, I have the numbering backwards, and so if I was to number, uh, name it this, I could still number it, I could go two bromo, one chloro, benzene, I have it alphabetized, right? So that's good. But the numbers should be ascending if possible. In other words, they should increase as you read left to right. So bromo, because it comes first in the alphabet, should become should come first when you number it. So this, this here, right, this is incorrect. If we have so um some of the other compounds they have here, right, toluene or phenol, some of the other ones we had, where, if you remember, we had benzoic acid, aniline, and uh, hmm, phenol. Phenol. If you are going to name, essentially, this is the root or the parent, right, as benzoic acid, aniline, or phenol, then this carbon to which this methyl group is attached automatically becomes carbon number one. Right? 
So if we're using the ortho meta pair system, we don't worry about numbers, we just find, we just say pair of bromotoluene. If we were going to number this, or uh, instead of using the pair, we would say this would be one, two, three, four bromotoluene. Four bromotoluene. The toluene takes care of the benzene ring and the methyl group, so there's no need to say anything about where this other, where the methyl group is. That's automatically assumed to be on carbon number one. It's only if we were to name it not as a toluene but as a methyl benzene. Okay, so if I were to name it as a methyl benzene, fine. It's a methyl benzene. And we have a bromine attached to it, so it's bromo methyl benzene and then then the numbering would have to be reversed because one uh, b comes before m so then it would be one bromo four methyl benzene but honestly most most people use the word toluene and they use the ortho meta pair system as you can see it's a lot easier and a list similarly here for phenol if we had uh, uh, naming it as a phenol, right? This carbon here automatically becomes carbon number one, so this is carbon number two. So we could also name it 2-nitrophenol. A phenol, phenol is also a hydroxybenzene, right? So if we named it as hydroxybenzene, it would be 1-hydroxy-2-nitrophenol. Let me go ahead and just write that down. 1-hydroxy-2-nitro, I'm sorry, 2-nitrobenzene, not phenol, benzene. Right, because the hydroxybenzene is a phenol. So if I'm, if I'm not naming it as a phenol, I'm naming it as a benzene, the hydroxy comes first, H comes before N. Right, so 1-hydroxy-2-nitrobenzene. Well, hydroxybenzene is a phenol, so if I'm naming it as a phenol, all I have left then is the nitro group. So I could say it's either 2-nitrophenol, right? I wrote that in blue here, 2-nitrophenol or orthonitrophenol. If you have three things, or I should say three or more attached, three or more substituents, then you have no ortho meta para. Right. Ortho meta para only allows you to show how two things are related to one another on the ring. Are they right next to each other? Are they in the middle? Are they across the ring from each other? If you have three things on the ring, well, the ethyl and the chloro are para, the ethyl and the propyl are ortho, and the propyl and the chloro are meta. So what are you going to use? Well, you're going to have to use numbers. So C comes before E comes before P, so you put them in alphabetical order. And now the numbers are not ascending. Right, it's 4-chloro-1-ethyl-2-propylbenzene. All right, well, why aren't the numbers ascending? Well, if we were to make the numbers ascending, we started with the chloro, right? So we start, if we started here, 1-chloro, right, 2, 3, this propyl group would be on carbon 3, and then the ethyl group on carbon four, one, four, three, this equals eight, right? One plus four plus three is eight. Four plus one plus two equals seven. So the reason this is not ascending, if possible, is because this way gives you a lower t total. What you want is the shortest path, the lowest sum of numbers here. If if it didn't matter, numbering in either direction, you got the same lowest number, yeah, sure, then you choose choose the one that gives you the numbers in ascending order. But here it just isn't possible. So here we have a benzene with a nitro group. This is aniline. Automatically, this if we're naming it as an aniline, this automatically becomes carbon number one. And again, we want to take the shortest path. So one, two, three, four, five is shorter. So it would be uh, two, five would be shorter than one, two, three, four, five, six, right? 
So if we numbered it to go in the other way, it would be 3, 6. 3, 6 dichloroaniline, and that's bigger than 2 and 5. Still more naming. When benzene, now sometimes you have, you know, see you have got a kind of a crazy molecule like this. Fine, here's a benzene ring, but we don't have a name for anything like this where this benzene ring is a, is a, got this, you know, goofy substituent. So in that case, when you have more complicated what we call a side chain, we're going to have to name benzene as, as a group, as a substituent. Right, so we're naming the benzene ring as a substituent. We not, do not say benzyl. Right? Uh, so methane becomes, let me write this up here. Methane, CH4, drop a hydrogen, becomes CH3, becomes methyl. Benzene, C6H, Oh, sorry, C6H6, right? When we remove a hydrogen, we don't get benzyl, we get phenyl, C6H5, right? This group here. So this is a phenyl ring. So we're going to start at the end closest to the first substituent. So 1, 2, we get a substituent, 1, 2. But this has both an ethyl and a bromo. So we're going to start here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right, so start, find the longest continuous chain, that's pentane. Then what do we have? We have a bromo on carbon 2, we have an ethyl on carbon 2, B comes before E, and then lastly, phenyl, P for phenyl, right? So that's on carbon 4. Now, there is a benzyl group. So remember, this guy was phenol. This is not phenol. This is benzyl alcohol. Fine, we have an alcohol. By the way, this is CH2 here, right? CH2. <clears throat> but it's not the alcohol is not directly attached to the ring. It's this benzene ring with the CH2 attached that is the benzyl group. So the benzyl is this. It's like a derivative of toluene. Toluene would be CH3. This is CH2 where we removed a hydrogen. That is the benzyl group. If we had an alcohol there, fine, benzyl alcohol. If there was an amine here, fine, benzylamine. This is not, so uh, benzoic acid though, this is not benzoic, uh, if we put an acid group out here, it would not be benzoic acid. Benzoic acid, it's this carbon that's directly attached to the ring. Let me go ahead and draw a benzoic acid down here. All right. The acid group is this carbon, this carboxyl acid, uh, this carboxyl carbon is directly attached to the ring. So if we had this, that is not benzyl, uh, that is not benzoic acid. Uh, lastly, compounds that are derivatives of benzene where they have one or more substituents because you know one or more hydrogens have been removed to repl you know, replace one of these hydrogens with a methyl group or whatever. These are known as aerial. I'm going to uh, go ahead and name these. What I think would be a good idea for you guys to do maybe is to think about what these names are. Try to name them yourself. Pause the video. And then we'll just go ahead and see how, see how I go about naming them. So, uh, first one, uh, this is carbon, carbon, carbon. This is an isopropyl group attached to a benzene. It's simply isopropyl benzene. Here we have a di substituted. This is an ethyl group. Here we have a bromo. So we and they're across the ring from one another. So they're para. So this is para bromo ethyl benzene or you could call it one bromo four ethyl benzene here these two groups are in meta positions we have a methyl one carbon and one two three a pro another 
isopropyl group and not isopropyl, right? This is n-propyl. So I comes before M, so this would be an meta propyl methyl benzene. Now we don't have a name for ethyl, an ethyl benzene, a common name for ethyl benzene, or a common name for propyl benzene, but we do have a common name for methyl benzene. A methyl benzene is toluene, so I could call this meta propyl toluene. And lastly, uh, I won't number it here. I won't write out the whole name, but if we were to number it, uh, P comes before. Actually, let me number the let me number the first one uh, in red here. Uh, P propyl comes before. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> M comes before P propyl, and then O P. So I did that wrong. Let me fix this. This would be meta methyl. Propyl benzene. So what we wanted to show you is a methyl benzene is a toluene, right? So if we were to number this, it would be one methyl, one, one, two, three propyl benzene. If I was to number this one in blue down here, instead of using meta, okay, well the toluene automatically makes this carbon carbon number one. So it would be one, two, three. It would be three propyl toluene. Three propyl toluene. This one, now this one's a little bit trickier. We have a phenol or alcohol group here, so that's a hydroxy, right, with phenol. And then an acid group, so benzoic acid, right? So there's a phenol and a benzoic acid. So as I said before, we could name this this guy here as like a, a methyl benzene, or we can name it as toluene. Here, I I really don't have a, a choice. I can't name it as a phenol because there's an acid present. Because the acid's present, it takes precedence, right? The more highly oxidized group it takes priority. So we could name this benzoic acid, a derivative of benzoic acid, right? So benzoic acid, and we could number it one, two like that, so we could call it 2-hydroxybenzoic acid, 2-hydroxybenzoic acid, right, the OH is a hydroxy group, or I could call it ortho hydroxybenzoic acid because these guys are right next to each other. There is a common name for this. This is known as salicylic acid. That's a common name that I wouldn't expect you to know, but you might come across it at some point. Salicylic acid is orthohydroxybenzoic acid. The next one here, tri substitute. One, two, three things attached. So I can't use orthometapara. That makes life a little bit easier. I can only use numbers. And so what we have here is the phenol. Right? So that's the phenol, which automatically makes this carbon number one. And one, two, I get to a substitution, or one, two, three. I get to a substituent. So I'm going to number it counterclockwise. And I have two methyl groups on carbons 2 and 5. So it's 2,5, 2, 5, 2 5 dimethyl, dimethylphenol. Here again, I have another phenol. Oh, by the way, um, you have methyl groups here, and you say, oh, well, could we name it as a xylene? Uh, probably not. And again, the reason, remember I said, well, if you had two uh, methyl groups, that's a xylene. One methyl group is a, is a toluene. But the reason for that is because there is an alcohol here, right? So that makes it a phenol. Now, so the, the alcohol and the methyl group together would be a cresol. I'm not aware of anything that has... Uh, two methyl groups and an alcohol. Maybe maybe there is some common name for that. I'm not aware of it. But uh, you can imagine how you could come up with maybe some other names. But more than likely, this is going to be named as a phenol because the alcohol is the most highly oxidized group and that takes precedence. Likewise, this is a phenol. 
So we got a bunch of nitro groups on there, phenol. And uh, this would be carbon one, so two, four, six, two, four, six, trinitrophenol. Two, four, six, dash trinitrophenol. The common name for this is actually called picric acid. And it is a fairly strong acid. Uh, again, if you go back to the chapter on acids and bases, you learn that any of these uh, electron withdrawing groups like chloros or nitro groups make this hydrogen easier to come off, stabilizes a conjugate base. There's induction effects and also resonance with the nitro group. So I won't get into all the details, but the alcohol group here for regular phenol, it's like pH, uh, the pKa is like 10. For picric acid, I believe it's something around the order of two, so it's actually approaching a uh, strong acid. Uh, last one here. Here we have a methyl group. This is, a, this is what I was thinking of here. This is a uh, toluene, and we have uh, two, four, six trinitrotoluene. Six trinitrotoluene. This is an explosive TNT. Trinitrotoluene. Microscopy review. I'm not going to get into this too much, except that you should. Uh, uh, maybe review this a little bit for both IR, proton NMR, carbon-13 NMR, because you might have some homework questions that deal with that. So you'll have a, uh, some uh, reactant, and they'll give you uh, some reaction conditions and they say, okay, you've got this product now, and it's got these various absorptions or um, you know, either proton or N uh, IR absorptions. And from that information, you can kind of figure out what functional groups are present or what uh, maybe what alkyl groups are attached to the benzene ring and that sort of thing and it can give you help in figuring out what the products of those reactions are. and again I won't uh, go into any of this carbon 13 NMR here that was, should be pretty fresh in your minds um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons PAHs one thing I'll tell you about these is uh, don't smoke so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are found in cigarette smoke. Um, many of them are highly carcinogenic, so causes uh, not only heart disease, stroke, lung disease, but also cancer. If you notice this number, no kidding here, this is the number of deaths per year from smoking, about 50,000 from secondhand smoke. So with the COVID-19 pandemic going on, you know, we're looking at, um, I think we had, there's about uh, maybe about 50,000 deaths nationwide as I'm recording this, and it's likely to increase to maybe uh, 100 or 200,000 deaths. Uh, hopefully we can keep it as low as possible. And I'm not saying that to diminish the COVID-19, but what I'm saying is we make such a big deal about COVID-19. Well, I think we should also be making a big deal about these deaths here. Notice the life expectancy here. For COVID-19, if you die, you usually die within three weeks. Uh, it takes you 13 to 14, well, I shouldn't say that. You, you're, um, it takes you decades to die, but you die 13 to 14 years earlier than a non-smoker. So a number of drugs here contain the benzene ring. One that has been in the news, uh, whoops, chloroquine. It's an anti-malarial drug also used for people with autoimmune diseases like lupus and I believe also rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> this also has a couple benzene rings. So there's a couple benzene rings that are fused together. And then this is actually a heterocyclic. I don't know if any of these are, yeah, it's heterocyclic. It's got a, this isn't a benzene ring though, but heterocyclic with the nitrogen in the ring. Chlorine that makes a chloroquine is out here. I believe hydroxychloroquine has the alcohol group here that's just basically used to make it a little bit more soluble. I don't think it has any effect on the drug as far as anti-malarial or, or its other uses. So anyway, you see benzene ring in a lot of, a lot of medicines. These are just um, two really cool polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. The thing that's neat about them is now, notice all of these carbons are all sp2 hybridized. Right? So they're all, 
uh, just a bunch of fused benzene rings. So for, for that reason, they can't be chiral, but the molecule itself is chiral because this thing, this um, helicine, twists out of the plane uh, for steric reasons, makes it uh, less stressed, or steric strain, relieves the steric strain. So because of that, this whole molecule is chiral despite not having a chiral carbon. Same thing with twistoflex. So the asymmetry arises from the overall shape, but there is no chiral carbon in these molecules. Kind of neat. So remember, if we add hydrogen to this, these are exothermic reactions. So the, the delta H for this hydrogenation, minus 120, so one double bond minus 120. If we had two double bonds, now they are conjugated, so this might be a, a little bit more stable than if they were isolated, but uh, you still see, if you divide this by two here, you still see, why don't we get 106, or, uh, yeah, 116, 116 kilojoules per mole per double bond because there's now two double bonds. So these two are pretty close, 120 versus 116. We put three in here, there's a big difference. Right? Divide 208 by three, 69, about 60, well, 69 and a third. So I just write 69 kilojoules per mole per double bond. So the double bonds here, well, what this means is benzene is more stable than it, it appears it should be, just based on this thermochemistry, this calorimetry here. So the other thing to notice here is, remember single bonds are longer than double bonds? Well, they've shown here this goofy shape. This is actually a molecule. This is, you know, I guess maybe one, three, five cyclohexatriene, where we have double bonds are shorter than single bonds, shorter, longer, so it's got this goofy shape, but we know it does not look like this. Instead, all the bond lengths are the same, and that's because these bonds are smeared out. They're more like a bond and a half, if you wish. So they have an intermediate bond length, intermediate bond energy, and benzene is more stable, it looks like it would be. And then lastly, because benzene is stable, and I mentioned it does not behave, does not react like an alkene. We put an alkene here. And this is a reaction you would have done in lab this semester if we had lab. It's a reaction that we talked about in the chapter on addition reaction. So you can add bromine across a double bond. And so bromine is a reddish brownish liquid. I'll just say it's red because that's the color I have. When you add bromine across this double bond, we no longer have elemental bromine. Instead, you have a 1,2-dibromo compound, and this is going to be colorless. So the bromine test is used to see if you have an alkene. You add uh, bromine and usually some organic solvent, like trichloroethane or something like that. And if the red color disappears, goes from red to colorless, it means you have an alkene. So, all right, so we have some unknown in here. Is it an alkene? sorry, an alkane, an alkene, or is it an aromatic compound, something that, can, something that contains a derivative of air, benzene or a derivative? So aromatic, that's the question. Well, what you do right, is you drop, and we drop in this bromine, right? So we're adding elemental bromine. Now, if the color stays, well actually let's back up, if the color disappears, as I was saying up here, goes from red to colorless, right, we know it's an alkene. But what if the color stays? And usually what will happen is the color gets diluted a little bit, so I'll just kind of put a few, you know. So the color gets diluted a little bit, but it stays red. Well, that tells me it can't be an alkane, but it could still be, I'm sorry, it can't be an alkene, but it could still be an alkane or an aromatic, right? Remember, if it was an alkene, we would have seen the disappearance of this red color. The bromine would have added across the double bond of the alkene. We would have had, it would have stayed colors, but no, the color stays, it stays red. So we know it's an, either an alkane or an alkene. 
So how do you tell the difference? What we'll do is add this Lewis acid catalyst. So you sprinkle a little bit of this in here and then ask what happens. So you do that and what you'll see is Again, the color stays. It still stays red. Right? So how do you know, how do you distinguish between these? Well, here they're saying, okay, when you add bromine with this Lewis acid catalyst, it substitutes here. And actually, let me go ahead and I won't go through the whole mechanism. That'll be for another lecture. But the bromine pair of electrons goes here. This goes there. And... Uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a single displacement reaction, or rather a double displacement reaction. The hydrogen and the bromine switch places, so you get the bromine now attached to the ring. But the color is you, you, you're not going to react enough of this bromine for the color to disappear, even after you added this Lewis, Lewis acid catalyst. So what you do is you take a moistened strip, so a moistened. Um, litmus paper. Uh, litmus is, turns red in acid, blue in base. Well, you want to use the blue Lewis, uh, the the blue litmus paper that's been wet a little bit, and you put it into the mouth of the test tube. Don't touch it to the liquid here, but just put it into the mouth of the test tube because what they are failing to show you here is when hydrogen replaces bromine, bromine replaces hydrogen. You're also going to get hydrobromic acid which is a gas and so the gas coming up this hydrobromic acid and it will then dissolve in the liquid that's moist in this litmus paper and of course it's an acid and so then it will turn the litmus paper red so we're looking from we're going from blue litmus to red so if you add this Lewis acid catalyst you're not going to just tell by looking at the color the color still stays here in the test tube but this Lewis, this litmus paper this blue litmus paper put into the mouth of the test tube will will come in contact with the hydrobromic acid and that is the indication that a reaction actually took place the litmus paper will go from blue to red now i tried to find some videos online showing you this experiment but i failed so uh, perhaps uh, next time i'm in lab I'll, I'll do this and maybe make a recording of it so i can show you or the next uh, the next class. All right, so that does it for so that'll do it for the first part of chapter 17. We went through I believe section uh, sections one through six. The next section we'll talk about aromaticity and what actually makes something aromatic. So stay tuned for that.